So we have concluded the negotiations and now we go on to the next phase. From green space and golf to a soccer stadium and offices. Hopefully they'll support it. Miami Freedom Park, Mayor Suarez fully supports it. He's with us live. And South Florida chooses a new member of Congress as state lawmakers get to work in Tallahassee, going for governor. The whole platform that he's put forward on this to me is uh, illogical, it is unconscionable. And going after the governor, we go one-on-one -on -one with Charlie Crist. It's all live this week in South Florida. Good morning, glad you could join us. I'm Michael Putnick, Lena has the day off. We have a packed show for you today, and we are going to start with Miami Mayor Francis Suarez, who is on a roll lately. He was just elected president of the National Conference of Mayors, which will raise his political profile nationally. At home, the mayor is attracting a bunch of high-tech companies to the city. He's advocating for crypto and supporting Miami Freedom Park. That is the billion-dollar complex that would be built on the site of the Mel Reese Golf Course just east of Miami International Airport. And the centerpiece of the complex would be a 25,000-seat soccer stadium for Inter-Miami FC, the MLS soccer team, co-owned by Jorge and Jose Masmos, Marcel Claré, and former soccer star David Beckham. Joining us now by way of Zoom is Miami Mayor Francis Suarez, Mr. Mayor Alcalde. Good morning. Great to see you. Good morning, Michael. It's uh, es un placer estar contigo. <laughs> Estoy muy contento. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, let's begin with Miami Freedom Park. You have been, from the beginning, a strong advocate for this park, taking 131 prime acres, really the last big green spot in the city of Miami, turning it over to the Moss brothers, Mr. Claret, Mr. Beckham, and letting them build this huge complex. Why is this a good idea? Well, it's a good idea because, look, first of all, I would love, as mayor, you always want the best of everything, right? I wish I could have a 200-acre uh, golf course and a, a sports complex, uh, both in my city. But unfortunately, oftentimes, uh, you have to make a decision. And it, the property is not mine. The property is the residents of the city of Miami. And so what we did was we put up to a vote. Uh, a few years ago, the concept of changing the purpose of the property. Right now, the property is, as you said, a golf course that is run by a private company, very well run, I, I might add, by a, a great uh, family, the DeLuca family, who have done a phenomenal job with the first tee program there. Um, and, and the idea was, you know, what do the residents of Miami want? What is their vision for the property? Do they want it to remain a golf course? Um, you know, golf can be a game uh, that that is limited in terms of the number of people that play it. Uh, the number of, of accessibility to the park itself, to the, the city asset. And so, you know, voters overwhelmingly supported the idea of negotiating with this group to bring a soccer team to Miami, number one. Number two, to create a 60-acre park. Right now, the, the property does not function as a park per se. It's a private golf course. you got to pay for it uh, and, and to be able to use it, and you can only use it for one purpose. Yeah. Um, and now it's going to have a 60-acre public a golf course. It's going to generate a billion dollars conservatively in revenue for the city, which is what makes, I think, the deal unique right. uh, in Mr. terms Mr. of sports Mayor, deals. Me, if, if I may, let me let me jump sure. in before sure. you sort of enumerate all the good things about this. The you know, if there is a downside, it's something like uh, former Judge Stan Blake. I spoke with him uh, late this week and he is a citizen of Miami and he says uh, essentially it's a land grab. You are giving this prime 131 acre piece of property to billionaires who, yes, are going to pay the city hundreds of millions of dollars over the years. But in fact, they're going to make hundreds of millions themselves. So, you know, what's the trade off? Well, does he play golf? <laughs> because usually the people who are uh, upset about the deal are, are, you know, they're obviously people who play golf at the course. And I can understand if you play golf at the course, that you're upset that you're not going to be able to do that uh, any longer. That's completely understandable. But I'll give you an example. Uh, in 1997, Miami, uh, the city of Miami, sold another golf course, a 200-acre golf course, to Miami Springs for $3 million. Now, Miami is going to be generating $10 million a year, uh, not $3 million total, $10 million a year for 99 years. It's a billion dollars in revenue just 
uh, off that property alone. Right now, on a good year, we generate two hundred and fifty thousand dollars from the hundred and thirty acres. So it's a, a significantly greater revenue a proposition for the yeah. city. And listen, don't take my word for it. Uh, we have, uh, you know all of the major uh, companies that are appraising this property that have come up with a land value uh, that is a fair market value proposition that we are are obviously bound by. Uh, so it's not it's not my perspective of what the value yeah. is. It's what, uh, you know, major, major I, appraisers. I, I, uh, I, I understand. All right, let's sort of uh, cut to the chase here. In a couple of weeks, this is going to come before the Miami City Commission. It needs four out of five commissioners to vote yes to sort of go on. That's not the final word. They have to be zoning changes and so on. But are there four votes on the Miami Commission to approve this? I think there are. And, and you know, obviously, you always hope that, that they get to unanimous vote, uh, uh, which is probably unlikely because one of the commissioners has been fairly adamantly against the deal from the inception. Yeah, Manolo but, Reyes. But, yeah, but certainly, uh, you know, whenever we do something, whenever I do something as mayor, my objective always is is to try to convince a unanimous uh, set of commissioners uh, as to the idea. I think in, in in my case, and I think this is where the judge and I might disagree a little bit, is we can have, you know, a disagreement on what's the best, uh, uh, you know, sort of objective for this property. But at the end of the day, it's the voters of Miami who own the property. I don't own it. He doesn't own it. Uh, the golfers don't own it. Uh, you know, and so for me, um, I, I left it to their decision making authority, which is why, you know, when more than 60 percent of the residents decided they wanted to go in this direction, that gives me a lot of comfort. That didn't happen in the Marlins deal, which I know people criticize heavily. Um, and, and that's something that should have happened during that deal. Right. Well, there are no at this point taxpayer monies involved in the development. Uh, correct. You know, the Moss brothers and Mr. Claré, Mr. Beckham have all said, no, we're going to pay for it rather than what happened with uh, Marlins Park. Uh, Mayor Suarez, let's move on. You just were elected president of the National Conference of Mayors. That's a big deal. Congratulations. Uh, it's going to you. raise your profile. And in your acceptance speech, you called them, called on your fellow mayors to sign a crypto compact. What, what is a crypto compact? Well, you know, as mayors, we're expected to lead. And I think our country has a generational opportunity to lean into innovation. And as you mentioned in sort of the beginning points when you were introducing me, you know, we as a city of Miami have leaned into innovation uh, as a city. And that, uh, we hope, will create uh, generational prosperity. You know, income inequality is a huge issue in this country and in our city. And there are di different ways to approach it. One of them, obviously, is to approach it from the expense side of the equation, which we always try to do by creating more affordable housing, easier transportation. But the other way is to approach it from the income side. We want to empower people. We want to create high paying jobs and give people pathways to prosperity. And crypto is on the vanguard of new technology. And I think as uh, countries like China ban crypto mining and ban uh, you know, Bitcoin, that's a great opportunity, a generational opportunity for our country and for our cities, which constitute 85 percent of the population of America, 91 percent of the GDP, to lean into a pro-innovation economy to create generational prosperity. Yeah. Uh, you have been extraordinarily successful at recruiting high tech companies to come in. Uh, your pitch has been successful. What, what do you tell these entrepreneurs who have been in the Silicon Valley or elsewhere and what have you said to bring them to the city of Miami? The pitch is very simple. The first thing we've said is we appreciate you. You know, a lot of cities across America don't. You know, famously in San Francisco, you had someone saying F Elon Musk. He replied back, message received and left to Austin. You had in New York, uh, you know, uh, New York City basically rejected Amazon, which was going to bring 50,000 high paying jobs to New York. So that's the first thing I tell them. The second thing I tell them is we're going to keep your taxes low. Um, we've maintained taxes at the second lowest level since the 1960s. And Mike, you may or may not be surprised to know that our budget has actually doubled in size, uh, which allows us to, to fund things like homelessness, right? We're at the lowest level of homelessness since the year 2013. Um, and we're just about to put out a plan to get to functional zero homeless and be one of the first cities in America uh, to be at zero homeless. And the third thing I say is we're going to increase funding for our police officers. We believe in public safety. We are a pro-public safety city. And what has happened as a result of that is, while many cities across America have increased their homicide rate enormously, in the yeah. city of Miami, we just had a 25% decrease in homicides, 14% decrease in contact shootings, 
And so it, yeah, it's a completely different news. narrative. But can, I, can I just ask you, uh, Manny Morales is the interim police chief in the city, seems to be doing a good job. Are you satisfied with the job he's doing? I'm extremely happy uh, with the job he's doing. Obviously, uh, one of the number one metrics that I'm looking at is, is violent crime, right? And when you see um, uh, murders going down, he actually, when he took over, it, it, we were at plus one, meaning we had one more homicide this year uh, than we had last year. And he took it down to negative uh, 15 uh, to get to a very, very, very low number of 46. You see cities like, unfortunately, like, uh, like Chicago and New York that are over 500 um, you know, it's, it's, it's really sad to see what's happening across American cities. Yeah. Uh, Amir Suarez, uh, you are 44 years old, for what it's worth. I have known you since you were a baby, so I'm glad to still have this contact with you. But I look at you, and you are a rising star in the political firmament. You are a Republican, registered Republican, although you perform nonpartisan duties. How far do you want to go? What, what are your political ambitions? Well, I'm 44 and you've known me since I was four. <laughs> so you, you've known me for about 40 years, maybe more. Uh, you know, look, for me, uh, a wise uh, elected official once told me, uh, do the job that you have well and it will open up doors in the future. And, you know, one of the things I've learned even from my dad's career is that there's always opportunities in politics if you want to serve. So right now what I have before me is being president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, which is an enormous task of guiding you know, all of America's cities on a platform that will create generational prosperity. That's something that excites me. That's something that will not be easy because, as you said, you know, I'm a non, uh, I'm a Republican uh, leading a, a predominantly Democratic organization and I'm a Republican that leads a predominantly Democrat city where I was reelected by 80 percent. So th I think the challenge is how do you get beyond the partisan rhetoric? How do you connect with people and how do you create an agenda that everyone can uh, sort of put their arms around. And then once that happens in a year and a half, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities to serve at a higher level. Um, and, and I'll take a look at those and make a decision at that point when it's uh, a little bit more timely. Well, we will certainly follow whatever you decide, Francis Suarez. Great to speak with you. Thank you for your time this morning. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. All right. Up next, the Republican candidate for Congress in the 20th Congressional District. Early voting ends today in Broward and Palm Beach counties in the race for Congress in the 20th district. That's an area that stretches from Miramar in Broward County to Riviera Beach in Palm Beach County. It's a majority black district. It was represented for nearly 30 years by the late Elsie Hastings. Jason Mariner is the Republican nominee in the 20th district race. He is an advertising executive and he joins us now via Zoom. Mr. Mariner, welcome. We're glad to see you. Thank you. Glad to be here. I appreciate you having me. And hello and good morning. Happy Sunday to everybody that's tuning in. <laughs> very, very good. All right. We want to point out that we invited Sheila Scherfelis McCormick, the Democratic nominee, to be part of this conversation with you. And she said she had a scheduling conflict. We regret that. Uh, Mr. Minner, why are you the better choice in this race? Um, well, this is a prime example. I show up when I'm asked to show up. Um, you know, I, I, I think there's a real uh, fairness issue here with uh, whether or not you give your constituents the opportunity to see you up against the person that you're running against. And, you know, I've invited that. Um, I've suggested it even to happen over and over again. I tried to make it happen when uh, we had a uh, debate with the League of Women Voters. It was actually a Q&A forum. Right. Um, but I wanted to ask her about certain things that she's campaigning on and get some answers and clarity for uh, my future constituents. And I can't seem to do that. Um, there's a there's a real lack of willingness to be transparent on some of these things. And I'm not the only one that's asking these questions. Uh, the whole community is. And uh, you know, th this right here is a shining example of why. Okay. Um, all right. But if you she's, really want to, she's not. To she's, the, uh, yeah, she she is not here again. You regret it. I regret it as well. You know, her main uh, campaign theme is a thousand dollar monthly payment to people who make less than seventy five thousand dollars a year. A kind of a guaranteed annual income. It's a sort of unlikely Congress would ever agree to that. But what's your opinion of that? 
Well, I, th- I think it's not only unlikely that Congress would ever agree to it. I think it's impossible and, and heaven forbid it would work to happen. It would be uh, driving inflation even higher. Um, it would be robbing the next several generations. It adds a trillion dollars a year to our spending. And if you think inflation is bad, if you think it costs a lot to fill up your car now, um, tack a trillion dollars on it and see what happens. And, uh, you know, I've sought clarity on that, too. Yeah. Um, I know that her uh, opponent in the primary was seeking clarity on it and has uh, even you know, called it bribery, and I call it the same. Um, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's an empty promise. And, and if you look past that, there's then really no platform. Yeah. There's no platform to speak yeah. of on that end. Um, yeah. It's the well, People's uh, Prosperity Plan. And we have tried to speak with her about it as well, and she has given us an explanation. I wish she were here to do it again. Uh, Mr. Mayor, let's talk about a, a difficult issue. Uh, you have a criminal record. You were spent yeah. nearly two years in the Palm Beach County Jail between 2007 and 2012. The charges included felony theft, burglary, cocaine possession, obstruction, resisting arrest with uh, violence, uh, serious stuff. Uh, Why should voters, given that history, um, vote for you? I would challenge you to find one person that's been unaffected by those issues. Um, The main issue being drug addiction. This is something that plagues our communities across South Florida. Um, I've looked around me for, you know, over a decade more, more than that and said, why do we keep picking people to represent us um, who are completely out of touch with we the people, who we are? Um, and, and you know, again, people are affected by this stuff. People are affected by drug addiction. And, you know, with that comes arrests. You get in yeah. trouble. And, and were you, in um, fact, yes. addicted to cocaine? I mean, was that why you got in trouble? Well, it started with a sports-related injury. I was put on pain medication. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if anybody knows anything about addiction, addiction kind of snowballs to the point where, you know, it's got your whole life. And it's it's a very tough cycle to break. Uh, we're seeing, you know, last year we saw 90,000 Americans perish due to addiction. This year uh, we've surpassed the 130,000-person mark. Yeah. And there's little being said about it. Sure. Now, and and um, I don't you know, want to... Yeah, I I don't want to sound too judgmental. I empathize with the people who have had their lives taken over by opioids and other kind of uh, drugs, fentanyl, things that are out there. Uh, Let's sort of get to the meat of the issue here, among others, which is that you describe yourself, Jason, as a America first Republican. You praise Donald Trump uh, in 2020 and in 2016. Donald Trump didn't win the 20th Congressional District. So is, is this district, which is predominantly black and Democratic, going to vote for you, a Trump Republican? Well, I think there's an issue with just asserting that black people won't vote for a white candidate. Um, I think that creates division that we don't need. I think that's one of the biggest issues that this country is faced with, is that is that driven division. It's constantly di- driven by... Uh, you know, big tech, it's driven by the media. You know, when I, the second that I entered this race, and, and I'm not blaming one side or the other because, honestly, I've heard it from both sides that, Jason, black people won't vote for you. And I'll, I'll tell you this. I said, I'm going to find out about that. And every single person that I've asked, no matter what they look like, has has told me that that is absolutely not the case. In fact, I spent the last three days down at a polling location with a group of people who were former Sheila supporters and they said, you know what, we're sick of her lies and we read up on you. We can relate more to you than we can relate to her. So, you know, that race card, people are done with it. It's a bad card to play. Um, It's not surprising when it is played, but, um, you know, America's catching on to the fact that when you have nothing left and you're up against the wall, that's the card that you pull out is you're racist. This is a, this is not a race thing okay this is a uh, elect somebody who's qualified to represent you and has you know experienced the things that plague the community it's kind of like having a doctor be the surgeon general or a veteran be somebody who uh you know runs the veterans administration it just makes sense to have somebody who's been there done that represent a community that's plagued by this stuff and oh. and let's face it district 20 uh, has a lot of problems with crime a lot of problems with drugs homelessness all that stuff and the majority of it is caused by addiction. Yeah. 
All right, Jason Mariner, we're glad that we gave you an opportunity to present your point of view and your case. We'll see what happens on Tuesday. Thanks for your time this morning. Thank you. All right, good. All right, coming up next, a preview of the annual legislative session. It's going to start on Tuesday. Well, hang on to your hats and wallets and purses. The Florida legislature is about to meet. Lawmakers will gather in the House chamber on Tuesday to hear the governor deliver his state of the state address. He's going to say it's very good. And then they will start on 60 days of hearings, debates and votes. At stake are the taxes you pay and the services you receive. It is a very big deal, although the machinations of these lawmakers often are too arcane for most people to understand, but not for the people who watch this program. So let's talk about the session to come here with two of South Florida's best, Jason Pizzo, state senator from Northeast Miami-Dade. Jason, good morning. He is a former prosecutor. Tom Fabricio is a Republican elected to the State House of Representatives from District 103. That includes parts of Doral, Medley, Miami Lakes, Aaliyah, Miramar, and Palm Springs North. Tom, great to see you again. Uh, good morning, Michael, and Hialeah Gardens. And Hialeah Gardens. Let's not forget Hialeah Gardens. Uh, all right, let me ask you both, as you well know, since you've served for a couple of terms, uh, a few issues dominate every legislative session. And Jason, uh, what are they going to be this time? Redistricting and what else? They're going to be redistricting sort of selfishly for legislators as, as well um, uh, for the general public. But, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't include uh, whatever is sort of on the agenda of the governor. Uh, th that's been the theme of the past few sessions. Whatever, whatever the hot button topic is, um, that my Republican colleagues sort of have to carry the carry the buckets for. Yeah. All right. Well, Tom Fabricio, you do have to carry some water for the governor. Uh, uh, what about what are your issues that you hope to address in the session? Well, we, we filed quite a few bills um, in my uh, for my district in particular. Uh, the first and the most important bill for my district in particular that I filed, I filed it last session. I'm filing it again. This session has to do with blasting. That's uh, yeah. uh, there's ground vibration issues in Southwest Broward and Northwest Miami-Dade County. And we're looking to reduce the ground by vibrations for the communities for where there are residential communities within one mile of those mines. That's that's the most important issue for my district. Yeah. yeah. Can also, I can I can I just interrupt to say sure. Channel 10 gets calls every day from people who live in these affected areas saying our house uh, is shaking. There are cracks in our walls. I mean, this has just gone on for years, and yet I don't know what's been done to really bring it to stop it. Well, I've been working. I worked hard last year to bring awareness of the issue here in Tallahassee, and uh, I've been doing the same this session. I refined the bill uh, to limit it in scope because the, as we all know, the aggregate uh, and concrete industry is very important in the state of Florida. It has to do with cost of construction, and that's important, and we don't want to cause trouble for that, and we certainly don't want to take away anybody's jobs. But where, where these mines are situated within one mile of residential areas, yeah. uh, specifically the Riviera Isles community or the Palm Springs North community and West Miami Lakes communities are very close, and sometimes just directly over I-75. Uh, those houses shake quite a bit. My house is a couple of miles away, and my house shakes quite a bit, especially yeah. this last week. So that's one of our important issues, but I'm also, uh, I've also filed a telehealth bill. We had, we filed it last year. It passed the house. It didn't pass the Senate, unfortunately. Uh, it's a critically important bill because it allows access to medical care for folks. I, I originally filed it uh, in mind of folks like my grandmother before she passed away in her elder years. She had a hard time getting around to different doctor's appointments right. for tweaking of medications. Yeah. Well, if I can, if I can ju jump in and simply say the issues you have mentioned are sort of the bread and butter issues that people are concerned about. I'm sure Jason Pizzo would agree. I mean, people are worried about the schools, crime, health, uh, insurance, taxes, and that's essentially what you're talking about. But Jason, to go back to your earlier point, the governor is really engaged in the culture wars here, talking about things like a state militia that would report to him. I, I mean, is that something we really need? Uh, no. And and I asked, you know, you know, my kids are likely 
laying in bed on a you know lazy Sunday right now watching this and we leave our, our families and, and come up here to do our best for our constituents. I'm nodding my head while while Tom's talking about his issues that are important to his constituents, like they are to the 15 cities that I represent, whether it's environmental, infrastructure, the kids killing kids in Liberty City and Overtown in my district. What are we doing about that? My first term here, we we, we dealt with immigration on, on something that was already sort of in law. We were just codifying it for, for what we call red meat at this point. Last year, we, we, we spent a whole day on transgender athletes. There were right. 11 of them over six years, but we didn't do anything as it relates to unemployment, even though I was away from home all but 41 days uh, in 2020 working on unemployment. Uh, this year, we'll, you know, they'll, they'll spring up something about abortion, something about being woke, something about, yeah. you know, a whole smattering of things, Michael, that don't improve your life, don't increase yeah. the safety of our children. Yeah. And, and certainly do nothing for the quality of life or, or for actual small businesses and protection, things like that. The yeah. things we're supposed to be doing. We yeah. don't do those. Yeah. We don't do those. Well, you do them after the other, the governor's other issues often. And it's both, you know, Democrats as well as Republicans drive these agenda. But, you know, uh, Tom Fabricio, Jason just mentioned, you know, this woke issue. The governor has been very outspoken. He doesn't like sensitivity training where people come in, talk about racial, ethnic differences, how to get along with people. He really says that that's all part of the uh, CRT, you know, critical race theory uh, kind of issue. Uh, what's your opinion? My, ish, my view with uh, critical race theory is, uh, you know, we haven't had a need to deal with that in schools historically. I don't see why that has to come in uh, to the curriculum now. Uh, my constituents uh, are generally against it. The constituents that have reached out to me are against it. But I got to tell you, important issues for my community also include a, a condo fraud bill, HB 811, that I filed. Right. And I filed it with regard to condominium issues. And I've been I've just been going through my emails while I've been waiting here this morning. And I'm, I'm getting a huge number of folks who believe that that condo fraud task force that we're looking to create should expand also to homeowners association. And yeah. these are bills we're doing a lot. Uh, you know, th there is a lot of national rhetoric and a lot of political uh, back and forth, uh, which is important. It's unequivocally important because uh, we are divided in many ways, unfortunately, but we're here, we're sent up here to do the people's work and we are doing the people's work in many ways. Uh, and I think the condo fraud bill that I'm that I've uh, filed that I hope uh, it, it, it's got a strong Senate yeah. uh, partner, and I expect that it's going to move along through the committee process as well as my, as my blasting and telehealth bill. Another bill that's critically important that I filed has to do with uh, giving police officers portal to portal insurance coverage. So when they drive their police cars from home into the police station and back and forth, uh, they're provided auto insurance coverage by the actual agency so that they don't have to put out of pocket for their oh. own auto insurance I, policy I had no, that. I had no idea they weren't covered. All right, gentlemen, hold on. We're going to come back. More questions about you and about the legislative session in just a minute. On this week in South Florida, we are previewing the upcoming session of the Florida Legislature. It starts on Tuesday with Representative Tom Fabricio and State Senator Jason Pizzo. Jason, uh, I don't think that Surfside is in your district, but it's just below your district. In fact, if it's not in your district. No, no, no Michael, it's, it's in my district and oh. I was there every single day but one. All um, right. I, I remember my father, yeah. I remember seeing you there. So the question then becomes, uh, what should the legislature do to... So, uh, we propose a number of ideas. We need to shorten, obviously, the recertification process. We need to consider buildings in the place of where they're found. So something that's coastal with a high water table that's subject to corrosive elements, I think should be aged in dog years. But condos is a perfect example of um, the, um, the importance, the critical importance of not having pride of authorship. Because we're in a Republican majority, I won't be the one that carries condo bills. I filed condo bills, but uh, Republicans don't let Democrats uh, get wins. Uh, and, and so you have to kind of swallow your pride a little bit and let other people. So Tom Fabricio, uh, who I respect, uh, is carrying a condo fraud task bill 811, the counterparts 266 in the Senate with Anna Marie Rodriguez. They're not in condo heavy districts. 64% of my district right. are condos. Those are my constituents. 
So uh, a friend of mine, a colleague, Senator Jen Bradley, very competent, very smart, chair of community affairs. She's going to be carrying the condo bill that a Jason Pizzo should have being in a condo heavy district. You know, her her leading bill last year was on farm equipment. There's, there, there are no condos in her district, but that's the way it is. It's, it's partisan. Last year, you remember the Sentner Academy, Academy in my yeah. district wanted to forbid uh, wanted to fire teachers who got vaccinated. One right. math teacher told the fifth graders, don't hug your parents if they've been vaccinated. Absolute quackery. I couldn't get my amendment passed to, to prohibit that. But the following session, this past session, it was it was slipped into the bill, uh, you know, Section 7 that, that no one paid attention to except for me. So if, if you don't have pride of authorship here, you can get a lot done. Uh, but, you know, it, it is we're, we're, we're in a hyper partisan, hyper polarized situation. So if the life and safety issues that involve uh, your family and my family and our constituents are better served by someone else carrying the bill, so be it. That's where we are. All right. So your name may not be on it, but you've got your fingerprints on it. That's uh, maybe just as important. Uh, Tom Fabricio, uh, we have all followed and we in the media certainly have followed fervently, you know, whatever the governor has said about COVID-19. And on Thursday of this week, he said, and the director of the Department of Emergency Management in Florida said, well, we had a million test kits in a warehouse and nobody asked for them, so uh, they expired and we had to throw them away. I, I mean, fr frankly, that strikes me as a, a terrible waste of uh, test kits which are in high demand. What do you think? Well, I got to tell you, I don't have the details on that. If you had told me about that specific issue ahead of time, I would have prepared and gotten some information on it. Uh, I presume that the the uh, the kits that expired uh, were not requested, and uh, they have a shelf life, and that shelf life expired. Yeah. yeah. I can tell you that. But what I can tell you is, um, I had a briefing on Monday at Broward General, and I spoke just shortly before this uh, interview now with uh, Broward General CEO as far as what's really going on uh, in Broward County with regard to the COVID and the Omicron numbers. And we see that uh, Broward General throughout that system, that's not only the Broward General Hospital uh, in Fort Lauderdale, but that's throughout the entire system. Uh, they have uh, 258 patients currently, and they have nine pediatric patients. And again, that's across the system overall. Uh, not many of those are in the ICU. It's uh, the vast majority of those are not in the ICU. And what they're finding is that about six, about 86% of those patients uh, that are hospitalized are um, are unvaccinated. Uh, yeah. So, Michael, if I may, uh, yeah, jump I'm in, sorry? Jason. Yeah, yeah l l let me jump in. The metric, the metric should not be and is is no longer how many people are on ICU beds. Okay, it's the economy, stupid. L l let's let's be very clear. I've had flights canceled this week. We have people, people, you know, businesses that are woefully understaffed. Uh, it, it is the economy, and, and I'm and I find myself in this weird twilight zone of a feeling because of the past couple sessions. We have a governor that wants to create a Florida OSHA, create a Florida militia, uh, ask for five million dollars during special session with no earmarks, deadlines, or, or or benchmarks or any kind of metric to determine the efficacy of, of the request. This is a guy who ran on deregulating things, and we're creating regulatory agencies. We're letting things expire. He waited till the literally the midnight hour during COVID last year on eviction moratoriums. The guy doesn't get economics. He just doesn't get finance. Yeah. He doesn't understand so, time so, value so, money. So, 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 I know you both have a lot. I know you both have a lot more to say. The governor doesn't understand economics. The fact is that the Tom, I'm going to have to interrupt you. Jason, I'm going to have to say, gentlemen, thanks very much. We'll see you another Sunday. All right, stay with us and we'll be right back. Three Democrats are vying for the right to run against Florida Governor Ron DeSantis in November. We're talking about State Senator Annette Tadeo of South Miami-Dade, State Agriculture Commissioner Nikki Freed, who comes from Fort Lauderdale, and Congressman Charlie Crist of St. Petersburg. Crist was in Miami late this week, and we talked, apologies beforehand, this interview took place outside near a busy and noisy street, so there is some extraneous noise. Congressman Charlie, great to see you again. Great to see you, Michael. Thanks for having me. As you well know, Governor Ron DeSantis and his Surgeon General, Dr. Lapido, 
are doing sort of a statewide tour in which they're saying a couple of things. Number one, don't get obsessed with testing. If you're really not sick, don't get tested. And then they talk about monoclonal antibodies, but they don't mention prevention. They don't talk about uh, vaccines. Michael, it's shocking to me that the governor isn't leading uh, on this issue. Uh, COVID is devastating, obviously. It's taken over the world and he doesn't advocate getting a vaccine. He doesn't advocate wearing a mask when you're indoors. Um, and now is sort of, you know, decrying getting tests done. How are you gonna know if you have COVID if you don't get a test? I mean, the whole platform that he's put forward on this to me is uh, illogical. It is unconscionable. It defies logic. On the other hand, as he would point out, the economy of the state of Florida appears to be in good shape, unemployment below 5%. We've got a couple of million visitors, even with COVID-19, uh, uh, Omicron. Uh, I mean, the economy overall seems to be in good shape. And he would say it's because I kept Florida open. I don't think that's why it's so good. It's because of Florida, not him. People want to come to the Sunshine State, especially this time of year. It's beautiful. I don't think Governor DeSantis can take credit for that. Uh, quite frankly, he could take better credit for the almost 63,000 Floridians that have lost their lives. The almost 4 million who have been impacted by COVID. And the fact that he won't advocate getting a vaccine or wearing a mask, just common sense things, defies logic, as I said. Yeah. And his handpicked Surgeon General is still talking about the efficacy of a couple of medications like hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin, which mainstream medical science says these really are not effective. But he, you know, Dr. Lapido keeps saying, consider them, use them. Well, my father's a physician, my sister's a physician. Uh, our Surgeon General in Florida, I don't think, is fit for office. I've called for him to resign or for the governor to remove him. I don't think he's giving good advice, certainly not good medical advice to the people of our state. Uh, it's fine to advocate some medicine if you happen to get sick, but everybody knows in medicine, prevention is the best answer, whether it's cancer or COVID. So you are running against two reputable, well thought of uh, Democrats, yes, Annette Tadeo and Nikki Freed. Uh, why are you the best candidate for Democratic voters? Listen, I think we're all better than what we have now. Uh, let me say that. And, and they're both friends of mine, uh, Nikki and Annette. And what I have as an objective is to defeat Ron DeSantis. Uh, I think he has been terrible for Florida, terrible for COVID, terrible for public education, hurting our environment. Florida deserves better, and that's why I'm running for governor. Yeah. All right. So let's say you get the nomination. You know, then you've got the the the, the mountain of running against the guy who's got more than sixty million dollars. Now, what you have raised is not chicken feed. More than five million but he's got 67 million. How do you do that? Well, I'm, I'm excited about the future. We're only in January. There's a long time to go. We're up to about 6 million now as of today, which I'm very pleased about. Okay. Um, but I'm not worried about the money. This election is about a lot more than money. This election is about people, about having a governor who cares. And Charlie Crist cares. And I think Governor DeSantis has proved he doesn't. He only cares about trying to be the Republican nominee for president in 2024. Yeah. Charlie, as you well know, next week the legislature is going to meet in its regular session. And there are a couple of things the governor has asked the legislature to do. One of them is to create a sort of election fraud cop shop. Uh, 52 police officers, sworn officers, who would, you know, it would cost $5.7 million. They would look into election fraud in Florida. Is that needed? I think that's a solution in, in search of a problem, and there, we don't need that solution. I mean, the governor himself, Michael, said that after last year's election in November, well, I should say in 2020, that in fact the case was we had a great election in Florida. And then he goes about trying to change the laws, make it harder to use mail-in ballots. As you said, have this you know, law enforcement task force to go after people who are voting. That's absurd. We hear about that in countries like Venezuela or right. Cuba, not Florida. Yeah. And what about the um, creation of a state militia, which would report only to the governor? Do we need that? We do not need that. You know, the notion that he wants a state militia. I mean, you know, what kind of tyrannical government is he trying to put together? It doesn't make sense to me. I don't think it makes sense to my fellow Floridians. Last time we had that was in World War II to protect the Capitol. We don't need that right now.
Um, there has been mentioned that there may possibly be a bill introduced that would mimic the Texas abortion bill or the Mississippi bill. In other words, it would you know, restrict abortion in the state of Florida. Uh, where do you stand on that? Well, I'm pro-choice. I think a woman's right to choose is something that we have to respect. Obviously, Governor DeSantis does not respect that, uh, and the legislature does not respect that. Uh, I think it'd be terrible for them to do something like the Texas law and rule out Roe versus Wade. I'm opposed to it. The governor wants to do it. Yeah. Uh, you have been touring the state, talking to people in North Florida, Central Florida, you know, Naples, Miami-Dade, Homestead, the Keys. What are the main things they are telling you they want in a governor? Leadership they can be proud of. A governor who cares about them who cares about their health and their safety with COVID, who cares about their children in school and doesn't tell school districts that kids can't wear masks. Let me give you one example. I have a five-year-old niece, started class back in August. Uh, Pinellas County didn't say that you had to wear a mask. After two days being there, she contracts COVID. She comes home to her two-month-old sister, then she contracts COVID. These are what bad policies do to real people all over the state of Florida. It's time for a change. Charlie, you've been in elected office almost all your life. You've been state senator, the education commissioner, secretary of state, uh, governor, uh, congressman. Um, Attorney so, General. And, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, I, I remember. It's too much to remember. No, <laughs> didn't mean to neglect. I know you love Bob Butterworth and I always do. praise Bob for yes. his time as attorney general. Yes, sir. Uh, I guess my point is that you clearly have devoted your life to public service, but public service seems to be not so well regarded by people anymore, and we are so divided politically, uh, even with all your experience. How do you bring people together? I think you try to lead by example, Michael. It's what you do as a journalist. I would try to do that as governor again and be decent with people, honor them, respect them and fight for them every single day and truly care about their future. Yeah. Uh, this interview, in fact, your campaign, is hardly about the media, but I have to say, Governor DeSantis, like President Trump, uh, beats up on the media. He keeps calling us the corporate media. Uh, you've always had a respectful and I, I think a good relationship with most people in newspapers, broadcasting in the state. Uh, do you see us as somehow uh, enemies of the people? I see uh, people in the press uh, as public servants, just like somebody who holds uh, public office. You disseminate information to the public at large. It's a big responsibility. You do it with uh, integrity. Most journalists do, thank God, and they need to be respected and, and honored. Finally, on this program, uh, we'd love to have you and Nikki Fried and Annette Tadeo come on before the primary in August and sort of hash out issues and whatever differences you have. Are you willing to do that? I think it's a great idea. Okay. Look forward to it. Me too, Michael. Sure. Thank, Thank you thanks so much. very much. My pleasure. Sir. And we'll be right back. Want to let you know that Glenna will be in Tallahassee for the start of the legislative session. Look for her live reports this week here on Local 10. Thanks so much for being with us today. We are online 24-7 at Local10.com. And remember, as always, stay informed, get involved. Have a great Sunday.